This podcast is brought to you by Knowledge at Wharton. Please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu for more information. Progress toward unfettered international commerce stumbled last week with the collapse of the World Trade Organization's Doha Talks, a seven-year effort to establish new global trade rules. The lengthy talks, which commenced in Doha, Qatar, and ended in Geneva, were complicated by the rapid emergence of China and India as major economic powers, powers with commercial and strategic interests to protect, and the clout to do so. It was far from clear in the aftermath of the collapse that the talks would resume in the foreseeable future. Some negotiators wondered if an agreement among so many nations was even possible. The fundamental reality is that it has become too complex, WTO General Director Pascal Lamy told the Financial Times. Wharton Professor Stephen Coburn, whose research interests include globalization, and Marshall Meyer, an authority on China's economy, recently spoke to Knowledge at Wharton about the collapse of the talks, global commerce, and China's interests in the rules governing trade. Welcome, Professor Coburn. The World Trade Organization's talk set the rules for governing international trade among more than 150 member nations. Now that the current round of talks, the Doha talks, have broken down, what's the practical effect? Trade is going to continue, no? I think in the short run, the threat isn't going to be dramatic. There'll be some minor impact on world GDP. I think the more serious threat in the longer run is the multilateral trading system as a whole in terms of how seriously countries take the World Trade Organization, how willing they are to abide by its principles, and especially how willing they are to abide by a negative decision in one of their tribunals. If that's the case, then what does trade look like in the absence of a global agreement of some sort? Well, the the absence of a, quote, global agreement is the absence of a fairly major but still marginal Uh, extension of the rules. Mm -hmm. So we still have a rule-based international trading system. We've had a series of negotiations since the period immediately after World War II. The GATT. The Mm -hmm. GATT through the current Doha round. Okay. They've been incremental. They've built on one another, culminating with the emergence of the World Trade Organization in 1994. Right. So we have a fairly broad-based system of rules to govern the international trading system. Okay. Uh, the question is extending those rules uh, further into agriculture, services, and other issues, which this round was going to do. And perhaps, as you mentioned, enforcing the rules if this harms the WTO's authority in some way. Well, one of the major uh, advances with the creation of the WTO in 1994 was a serious tribunal. The big change with the WTO vis-a-vis the GATT is it was much more difficult for a country to ignore a finding that wasn't in its favor. I see. And to, to date, none of the major countries has. Okay. But there's still no way to compel a country to go along with a WTO finding. Mm-hmm. It's based on a belief in mutual self-interest and a belief in the benefits of a multilateral system. And the danger is that without the talks proceeding, that that could erode. There was a uh, Wall Street Journal article immediately after the talks collapsed that said the they could uh, signal an end to some 60 years of uh, continuous expansion of global free trade deals. That does sound pretty dramatic, but it sounds similar to what you've just described. I think it is overly dramatic. Mm -hmm. I think it may signal an end to the incremental progress, again, since the first GATT talks in the late 40s. Mm -hmm. And what's happened since then is first the low-hanging fruit was grabbed off the tree earliest, And second, the world economy has become much more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the 60s, the Kennedy round, which was one of the major post-war rounds, you probably had eight or nine countries that needed to uh, come to agreement to reach a deal. Even in the Uruguay round, most of the developing countries were sidelined. All of a sudden, I think rightfully so, in the Doha round, you have 163 countries, of which probably 60 or 70 have a major voice in the negotiations. I see. I, and so I think what's changed is the ease, and that's too strong a word, but the process of multilateral negotiations with the WTO meeting as a whole mm-hmm. and able to hammer out an agreement among all the members. Exactly. So I think any further progress may require somewhat of a different process. Mm-hmm. Okay. There were a lot of uh, reasons that the bro- talks broke down, but 
in addition to having uh, more inclusiveness and in many more countries participating, the, the role in which they participated was different. I mean, with China and India, Brazil emerging as major economic powers, they had a lot more, perhaps they had more clout than they did before. Um, certainly they had interests that had to be contended with. Yeah, and, and that's what I was talking about just yeah. previously. And I, I think that's true in the sense that a, a lot of the developing countries have become serious players in the world economy and have a serious voice in the negotiations. Okay. And that means that as diverse as the 30 or 31 OECD members are, mm -hmm. that pales when you start to consider China and India and Uruguay, uh, whose levels of economic development, whose objectives, whose political systems, whose economic beliefs differ vastly among themselves and vis-a-vis -vis the traditional members of the OECD. I see. Do you think that it's possible for the traditional economic powers in North America and Europe and Asia uh, and these in emerging economic powers to ever reach an agreement on trade given their divergent interests? And, and especially under the rules of these talks in which I believe any one member can veto uh, a particular um, um, portion of the agreement uh, and make the whole agreement come to a crashing halt. I think, in effect, one member can veto it. I don't think that's what happened this time around. No, okay. Uh, I think it may represent, as I said before, a change in the nature of process. The, the, our ability to reach a multilateral agreement on a wide-reaching uh, set of issues among 160 different countries may be beyond our reach at this point. Uh, may not be possible. Uh, we may have to e a either A, negotiate on smaller pieces uh, among all of the countries, or B, even break down into regional negotiations, which then tend to come together in a community, uh, in a committee of the whole, oh, so that you achieve free trade on a regional level and then move to a global level. Uh, as I said before, we may have to break the negotiations down into smaller pieces. I think, the, to use the standard analogy, the bicycle will keep moving ahead but I think it's going to have to do it at a different pace and in a very different way. Given the change in the dynamic of the number of countries participating in the divergent interests, is there any reason to think that these talks would resume anytime soon in their, in their current form? Or do you think that some of the, if they do resume, they'll resume in one form or another of some of the different um, uh, uh, scenarios that you've described, regional or or one, one measure at a time? Uh, they could resume. I think it would be very difficult to reach a broad-based agreement mm -hmm. without some sort of major shock that mm -hmm. got everyone's attention uh, and, and, and forced people to make compromises and agree. I think what's much more likely is, they, again, we take smaller pieces of the puzzle, solve those, and then stitch them together. Uh, do you think it is possible that the collapse of the talks um, in this particular round will energize free trade critics in the United States. It's always been everybody's favorite uh, whipping boy. Uh, I'm not sure that they need energizing. <laughs> I think a lot of concerns about trade uh, revolve around the business cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and as times get more difficult, uh, I think more and more people will start to question the benefits of free trade, the value of outsourcing, the value of inward flows of investment. Mm -hmm. uh, so the collapse of the talks certainly isn't going to help, but I suspect it's not going to be a major factor in energizing opposition to globalization or free trade. Trade's always been a tough issue for U.S. voters to resolve, uh, and it's likely that it's going to be an important issue in this fall's presidential election. On one hand, people generally understand that free trade in the long term is necessary to spread economic opportunity globally, but on the other hand, it can the, the long term can mean a very long time between paychecks. So it's tempting for politicians to latch on to free trade as an issue to beat each other over the head with. Do you think that, um, uh, well, if you were a voter or if you were giving advice to voters, um, how would you say they should approach this issue? I mean, how do you try to get a, a handle on the importance of free trade? I believe in an open economy. That doesn't mean a lack of all regulation or restriction, okay? In any open system, any country that's open to the world economy, there are going to be winners and losers. 
and that's clear. People are more concerned about the losers as they feel more threatened themselves economically. Uh, I think one of the things we need to do, which has been talked about for 50 years, is building more of a secure safety net for people who fall through the cracks of free trade. I think it may be beneficial to the economy as a whole, and it isn't clear in every instance, but I think generally it is true. Uh, it, free trade doesn't represent a gain for any individual or every industry. And I think there have to be, has to be more attention paid to su providing some form of support for those who lose jobs, uh, need retraining, need temporary employment, uh, unemployment payments, and the like. Thanks for joining us, Professor. Uh, when we first asked you about your reaction to the collapse of the trade talks, you said that China wants to protect its inefficient farmers. What about their agricultural system is inefficient? Well, you know, China still has more farmers, uh, more rural population than urban population. Last numbers I saw, 42% urban, 58% rural. Mm -hmm. uh, rural population is shrinking maybe 1% a year which is a very, very dramatic rate of urbanization mm -hmm. given the size of the country, but still huge rural population. Now let's look at Chinese geography. Um, you got 1.3 roughly billion people, 58% are rural. That translates into roughly 770 million, quote, rural residents. They live in very high density almost all of them in an area that's like the U equivalent to the U.S. east of the Mississippi River. So you've got a lot of rural pop, you've got lar large rural population mm -hmm. concentrated in a very small area. Some say that 40% of the world's farmers live in China. Maybe it's 38% today, mm -hmm. working 10% of the world's arable land. Now this tells you that farm plots or rice paddies right. in China are very, very small. And they're not really conducive to consolidation, large-scale farming. Because in the south of China, at least, Inner Mongolia would be a little different where they have grasslands, but, uh, uh, but the south of China, mm -hmm. much of this is terraced. This is historical. This has been going right. on for years. And it's very hard to convert terraced rice paddies into large, efficient farms. Mm -hmm. um, so the consequence is small-scale, at least for grains, small-scale production, okay. which by global standards is going to be inefficient. Absolutely, yeah. So are there other geographic areas in China where agriculture could occur but does not? Or is that just, or are the areas that are farmable being farmed? Um, we, mo most people in the U.S. don't realize that China's land mass is about the same as the U.S., mm -hmm. but two-thirds of it's desert or, right. you know, mountain that you really can't do anything about. Mm -hmm. So the answer is, yeah, if they had a lot more water, and water's becoming a huge crisis in the north of China, mm -hmm. they're planning to divert water like the old Grand Canal, you know, from, uh, from three gorges up north in China to relieve the pressures on the Beijing and Tianjin water supplies. No, 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 they're losing through urbanization and desertification a lot of farmland. The obvious place would first be, again, try to get the grasslands of Inner Mongolia more productive, keep the sandstorms down, and then if they could find any water anywhere, begin to irrigate, say, Qinghai province mm -hmm. um, and uh, get some intensive agriculture, as Israel has done. They have Israel as a model, mm -hmm. um, but so far their attempt to emulate that model has not been terribly successful. Okay. Is there a problem with the access to technology that, um, that American farmers have, or would the technology not make a big difference given the, the nature of the farming there? Well, it does make a difference, but in an area not critical to China. Mm -hmm. okay. Small plot intensive agriculture is great for produce. And there's a very active, very profitable produce market in China. So. Um, uh, and some of the produce is, is high value, is exported, brings money into China. Mm -hmm. So you, you can go to this town called uh, Shoguang, 
which is in the middle of Shandong province between uh, Jinan, the capital, and Qingdao, where large companies like Hire and Hisense are located. And you will see trucks from all over, this, all over China coming together and just, just, you've never seen so much produce in your life. And they have to move it very quickly because obviously it deteriorates. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, this is a city of about, a town of about a million, you know, one traffic light, one movie theater. Uh, but um, you, you can see how active this, this, this kind of high value produce industry is in China. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to feed the masses of China. Right. No, what China needs is, is rice for the South, wheat, and also soybeans. And presently, they're huge imp they are importing huge quantities of these. But because of the price gap, um, even with elevated world prices, they've got to do something to protect their farmers. They formerly used direct subsidies. Mm -hmm. But I think they want the right to impose tariffs if they think their domestic producers are going to be overwhelmed. And this is a matter of national self-sufficiency, as mentioned to you earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, China sees what's happening with petroleum in the United States. They don't want to be dependent on foreign sources right. um, for um, fundamental foodstuffs. Again, wheat, rice, to some extent, soybeans. And their dependence is much greater than, already much greater than you think it is. Because let's say they're importing 12% of their food supply, which I, I think is, is probably a good number to use as a rough number. Mm -hmm. Could be 10, could be 15, I'm going to say 12. Um, doesn't sound like too much. But if you've got 58% of your population, 60% of your population sort of growing food for themselves, okay, that means it's, you're really not looking at, at 12 over 100, you're looking at, say, 12 over 42. Mm -hmm. In other words, food that's in the market. And 12 over 42 is is roughly 30% of the, of the food that's in the market right. is imported. And that means that they're just terribly vulnerable to global price fluctuations, at least in the urban areas of China. Mm -hmm. Which is why you had said it's a really a strategic, it's very much a strategic issue very for them, not entirely. Issue. And there's something else going on. Um, aside from the, the uh, uh, global fluctuations in price of grain, uh, for many, many reasons, including some say ethanol, China's had a particular problem this year, not with grain, but with meat. They've had something called blue ear disease, which has destroyed a lot of, 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 of their pigs. Okay. And as a consequence, the price of meat in China has shot up uh, between 40 and 50 percent in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. It means the overall food prices have shot up about 25 percent. And in a country where, say, 35, 40 percent of the household budget's food, um, uh, this has had very, very dramatic impact on people. And uh, the, the, the Chinese need to do what they can to kind of keep these prices in check on the one hand, but also to protect their domestic producers and their incomes. Right. And for China, it, in, it, well, in many nations, uh, the, the, the government will try to protect its, its, uh, its farmers for um, domestic political reasons. Sure. And one might think that that's less important in China. Because they, they don't vote. They don't vote. Uh, but they, but they do other things. They vote with their feet. Yes. And by meaning voting with their feet is they riot. Mm -hmm. and, and through 2005, the Chinese government actually published statistics on what they call mass disturbances. No one knew quite what that meant. Was it two or more people or 12 or more people? But whatever it was, it was. And you could see the graph going up exponentially, and they stopped releasing these numbers. But your anecdotal accounts tell you that discontent in the rural communities has shot up in China. Uh, some people tell me that Premier Wen Jiabo, first thing he looks at in the morning are these reports of discontent, particularly in rural areas. We've read in the newspaper various accounts of riots. And uh, the government is very, very sensitive to this. This is a historical thing in China. It's not just under communism that they've had spontaneous riots. It was part of the political process in China. Instead of, of going to the ballots yeah. box, people yeah. would just get out there and riot for and sometimes for five years in a row. But Goodness. the Chinese government really wants to minimize this for all kinds of reasons, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, so then is it in China's interest to, uh, I mean, to return to the talks or see the talks it, revived? I mean, it, a lot of people are saying that they, they threw in this last minute demand on the uh, on, on some of the tariff uh, negotiations to derail the talks, it would seem that it's in their best interest to have some sort of a trade agreement. 
Uh, I would think so. Again, I'm not an expert on trade, mm -hmm. but I, 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 I would think that um, um, from the point of view of the export economy, which they've so heavily depended, yeah, it is in their interest to have a trade agreement. Mm -hmm. um, but I think right now um, uh, the, the, the priority for the, Chinese, the, the current Chinese government um, is national self-sufficiency mm -hmm. uh, in food and, again, protecting the farmers among whom discontent, where, where discontent is, 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 I think, very high right now okay. for all kinds of reasons. Given the, the um, uh, geographical situation there, is it a reasonable expectation for them to be self-sufficient uh, uh, agriculturally? That's a very interesting question because just as, think of this geopolitically, um, just as the world depends heavily on the Middle East for oil, mm -hmm. the world unfettered would depend heavily on the English-speaking countries, U.S., Canada, Australia particularly, for the global supply of grain. There are many reasons for this. And the question that's being raised is, can the world afford to be that dependent on one block of countries? Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer, I think, remains unknown. But that's, I think, there, there lies the issue. U.S., Canada, and Australia, particularly U.S. and Canada, are uniquely positioned to supply the world with grain. And that has to, na to do with the nature of weather patterns. Um, I don't know if you recall, but the Soviet Union used to go through periodic, I won't say starvations. China did have a great starvation and a great, great, mm -hmm. great leap forward. But the Soviet Union used to have periodic food shortages, and it wasn't just due to socialism. See, if you look... If you look at the crop bands in the Soviet Union, you know, the wheat's grown in the south, say in, in Georgia and Ukraine, so on and so forth, the crop bands run east to west. Mm -hmm. In the U.S. and Canada, they run north to south. And that means, look, you know, where's our wheat belt? Where's our corn belt? You can just see these vertical stripes across the map, U.S. and Canada. So weather patterns shift, but you still get production. Right. Because That's somewhere, not, somewhere on the Somewhere continent. you're getting production. Exactly. Okay, that doesn't happen in Eurasia. Much more vulnerable to climate changes. Mm -hmm. And China in particular, as well as India, by the way, have another huge problem called water. The north of China, the wheat area, is arid. Desertification is happening. If you've ever been in Beijing in a, sand, in a sandstorm, you'll know what the word desertification means. Mm. You know, you know, when they tell you that, you know, over a good weekend, 318,000 tons of sand were deposited in Beijing. Um, and it's not the kind of sand, you know, it's in your kid's sandbox. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that when it gets into jet engines, makes the engine manufacturers very happy. It's like throwing an abrasive into your vehicle's engine, right? Mm -hmm. Or in the aircraft engine. Um, when you see this happening, you know that their capacity to grow food is going to be constrained going forward unless either climate change reverses or they find some way to engineer water supplies in the north of China. I don't know the topography of India all that well, but I understand that there are similar problems in India. Certainly, yes. Okay. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for, for joining us. More than us welcome. Today. It was fun. For more information, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.